You've got this dandelion that's in the ground and it goes down like a foot. Right? So it's literally plugged in. And it's like a temperature indicator, a relatively sophisticated temperature indicator plugged right into your soil all over the place in your property. And what could you buy that could even come close to, to doing that good of a job? You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 133, brought to you by Vessi Seeds. And today, it's just me here in the backyard. I found a place that wasn't too really windy today. And as you can tell, um, it's the day before spring as I'm recording this. Or no, it's the day before, what is it, March 30th. It's the day before April 1st. Uh, and as you can tell from my surroundings, it doesn't really look like it's about to be April. Uh, but it is. Tomorrow it's April 1st. I guess this is an April Fool's joke played on me and every other gardener out there because it's it's kind of cold. It's uh, hovering around the freezing temperatures today and there's snow everywhere. But the sun's out, the sun's shining. We'll see how things go. And I guess apropos of that, I thought I would answer the most common question I tend to get. I work in an office with other people and everybody knows I'm a garden guy and that sort of thing. So this is the most common question I tend to get this time of year. Uh, when should I put my garden in? When should I plant things? What, what, what do I do? When do I do it? <laughs> you know, that sort of thing, right? Um, and I've got a really simple way of doing it. Um, so in this podcast, I'm going to explain how I base everything, all my planting times, on the stages of growth of the dandelion. Now I'm going to lay, roll this out in this recording as I'm going to start with just what to do, because people want answers. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to start with what to do and when to do it. And then I'll go into this the sort of scientific, philosophical, the reasoning behind why I think it's a good way to go about determining when to plant things. Okay, and then I'll talk about uh, some modifications, rules of thumb for transplants, and also using plastic domes and things like that to, to cheat and trick, uh, trick your garden and your plants into thinking it's a little bit warmer than it really is, uh, strategies for that sort of thing. So let's get started. So this is all based on an article I wrote a year ago on my Substack page. And if you had not subscribed to that, do it now. Uh, I think it's $5 a month um, for a paid subscriber for, and um, $30 a year. Um, you can also be a free subscriber. I've made this article free. So right up until now, it was only my paid subscribers that could see this one. But this particular article, uh, as of today, I've just decided to make it free for everyone. So if you watch this podcast, it'll be, uh, if you watch it on YouTube or if you download and listen to it from my website or or wherever you get your podcasts, <laughs> uh, just check out the, um, you know, the little write-up or the description box in the YouTube video. I'll have a link for that Substack article, and it goes into detail, and you can and just you know, put a little shortcut to that, and you can look at it whenever you want. So it's got all the different, uh, the different graphics and visuals that I, I'm going to show uh, over the course of this video. For those that are just listening, <laughs> there's some graphics that might be useful. Just go to the Substack article and all the information will be there and it's totally free. Um, but yeah, if you become a paid subscriber, it's $5 a, a month or $30 for a year. And you get access to everything. If you're free, you get some, some stuff, but you don't get everything. And I think also it's only the paid subscribers that get to comment. And I'm usually pretty, pretty quick to respond to comments on that because it's just my paid subscribers. I'm getting to a stage with everything I'm doing now where... Uh, I get so many comments and so much, you know, sort of input from the viewers, which is great, but it's getting harder and harder to really stay on top of it. Um, if I get a really good comment or question from a viewer, I tend to make a whole video about it or I make a note. I get a little whiteboard in my, um, in my office where all the ma magic happens and whatever, I can't think of a, something to make a video about. I just answer one of the questions, my, uh, you know, sort of a good question that I know would take me like two pages of writing to answer. And if, if it's going to take two pages to, you know, of writing to answer, that's, that might as well be a video, so I'll do that. So I'll keep those questions coming, and perhaps I'll turn your question into a, a whole video on my YouTube page. But anyway, let's get, let's get going here. So it's all based on this article, and what I, just, what I noticed was that you've got the dandelion, everybody has dandelions, and they grow in different stages, right, early in spring you'll have just the little green shoots poking out of the ground. And then a bit later in spring, you'll have the yellow dandelion flowers. And make sure you're looking at dandelions and not some other thing like Colts Fit, because there's some other things that look like dandelions that aren't dandelions, but dandelions are pretty distinct, right? Uh, if, you're, if you're used to identifying them. So you got the greens, when they appear, when they appear to be growing, new growth, 
which is right around now usually, sometime around now. It doesn't, I can't even tell right now because my lawn's covered in snow, but I'm sure there's some dandelions beginning to grow. Um, and then you've got the, the yellow flowers when they open up, right? You get the flowers forming as buds, and then when the flowers open up, you start seeing yellow flowers, right? That's another stage of the seasonal change where there's been enough sun and the soil's warm enough for that to happen. Then you got a final stage of the dandelion cycle where the flowers are white and, you know, if you blow on them, the, the stuff starts coming off, right? The flower has finally gone to seed. So for me, these indicate three different temperature, major temperature changes, right? Because you, you, for all of those things to happen, there has to have been enough heat, uh, enough sun and enough heat absorbed into the ground for the plant to mature to do those things. And all of those things tend to happen in the spring. And you can base when to plant things on those things. So I got a table here. And so the way I've looked at it is that your, the greens are the hardy things. You know, hardy things can go in when you see the greens. The semi-hardy things can go in when you see the yellow flowers. And then all the tender things can go in when you see the whites, you know, when the dandelion flower turns, it goes from yellow to white. So what are we talking about here? For the green things, the dandelion greens, I'm talking about things like lettuce, like pars uh, parsnips, like onions, right? Or anything in that family, right? And uh, spinach, right? Things like that. These are really, really, really tough plants. They're extremely hardy. They don't mind if it freezes. The seed can freeze, the seed can thaw. A tiny little seedling can freeze and thaw overnight. They're extremely tough plants and they can make it. And those can go in when you start seeing your dandelion greens. Uh, when you start seeing the dandelion yellows, that's when a lot of things can go in. So we're talking uh, asparagus, uh, beets, cabbage, kale, that whole coal family, uh, carrots, cauliflower, that's also coal, I guess, uh, Swiss chard, corn, uh, parsley, peas, Potato, I mean, peas are tough, but they're not quite as tough as things like lettuce and spinach. So you really, so little will happen if you plant the peas at dandelion green. It, it's, it, you're really not getting ahead of things too much by just waiting to see the dandelion yellows. Uh, potatoes, um, uh, radishes, um, and uh, turnip, and uh, turnip, yeah, I would say turnip, okay. And then the things that go in when the dandelion turns white, that's where we, it's so windy here. I, I, I got some notes here in front of me, but they're moving around. They won't stay put. I should have brought another clip out. Um, anyway, when the dandelion turns white, that's when you can put the most tender things in. Your beans, your cucumbers, your eggplant, including the transplant, right? Whether you're going from direct seed or you're putting a transplant in, okay? Uh, cucumber, eggplant, pumpkins, uh, melons, things like that, uh, peppers, um, and squash, uh, that, you know, all those sort of really tender things that um, can't handle the slightest bit of frost, okay? So that is, that's the system, that's all you do, you just watch the dandelions. Now, if, you're a, if, you, wanna, if you wanna take risks, you plant these things as soon as you see a dandelion somewhere. If you want to be more conservative, like, so I've got a house and, you know, the house has a lawn on every side of the house, right? So uh, the dandelions will show up on the south side of the house first, right? So if I planted all the things that can go in when the yellow dandelion shows up, when that happens, it would be a bit risky. If I noticed that I had dandelions on the southeast and west side of the house, that's a little more conservative, a little less, less risky because it's, it's clearly, it takes a few more weeks for that to happen, right? And then if I waited till I saw dandelions all the way around the house, even on the north side, right? Where they get the least amount of sun and the least amount of light, right? That's the safest. Now for any one of these stages, if you want to be extremely careful, you sort of wait till you're seeing dandelions everywhere. Um, whatever the stage is, the greens, the yellows, or the whites. Um, but a lot of us um, gardeners were impetuous, we're like children, we want to make things happen. You know, first nice, I remember a week ago, I was out in the garden, uh, a week ago on Saturday, I think it was seven degrees above freezing, it was a sunny day, I was out there with my kids, we were working in the garden, we all had just hoodies on, I don't even think, I think I just had a ball cap on, like no toque like this. 
and I was hot. I had to take a shower when I came inside. We're moving with stuff around and doing some work. We're out there for about three hours, and I was like, this is amazing. I want to plant everything tomorrow. And the very next day, it was freezing and miserable, and, <laughs> and I haven't planted anything yet. <laughs> um, but maybe this weekend, if things, I think tomorrow is supposed to be a lousy day. Um, but, you know, today, if things can melt, maybe I'll put a couple things in. Maybe I'll put parsnips in today, right? I tend to plant those first anyway. And for that matter, certain things like parsnips, the seeds are so tough, you can put those in the ground in the fall. And they'll just hang out and wait all winter long and start growing in the spring. So, you know, if you have an enormously large gardening, a lot of things to do, certain things you can even do in the fall, but it really depends on the plant and whether or not it can handle the extremes of winter. Okay, so let me explain how I arrived at this approach and why it works. All right, so let me explain how this works. And how I got started with this whole thing was a rule of thumb. It's based on a very old and reliable rule of thumb for planting potatoes. Uh, the rule goes when you see the dandelions turn yellow, that's when you put your potatoes in the ground. And I guess the, the general rule of thumb with that is when the dandelions are yellow, you still have risk of frost. Um, but it's, you're, there's only a couple weeks of that left, right? So when you put the potatoes in the ground, they're underground. And, and with mine, they're even under a mulch. So they're underground. The ground is warm enough that the potatoes won't die. Because your potato, you know, you put a potato in the ground, it's alive. It's warm enough the potato won't die. It's warm enough that the potato will start to send out roots and grow a little bit. Uh, but it's going to, be, going to be a couple weeks before the potato puts foliage out above ground. So it's very likely that if you put the potato in the ground when the dandelions are yellow, that it won't poke up through the ground and all those leaves will start showing up until the dandelions will turn white, right? And generally speaking, when the dandelions turn white, I've noticed it's, it's usually very, very low risk of frost, okay? Uh, so that was a rule of thumb. And then I explored... Um, a, a method of determining planting times called phenology, which is a very old, uh, you know, it's almost like a pre, pre-written word, uh, you know, very kind of, um, you know, old peasants in olden times, ye olden days, right? This is how they would decide to do things. And it seems uh, uh, kind of primitive, but it's extremely robust and fairly sophisticated. Um, but there's all these rules of thumb that are hard to remember. I'll just run through them, a few of them here for you. Uh, so when the forsythia is in bloom, it is safe to plant peas, onion sets, and lettuce. Half-hardy vegetables, including beets, carrots, and chard, can be planted when the daffodils blossom. Uh, I got these from the Farmer's Almanac. Um, look to, for dandelions to bloom before planting potatoes. Uh, perennial flowers can be planted when the maple trees begin to leaf out. When quince is blossoming, transplant cabbage and broccoli. Wait for apple trees to bloom before planting bush beans. I don't know why they don't say vine beans too, but um, when the apple blossoms, plant pole beans and cucumbers. By the time the lilacs are in full bloom, it'll be safe to plant tenure annual, and so on and so on and so. Transplant toma uh, tomatoes when lily of the valley is in full flower. Um, full size maple leaves tell you when it's time to plant morning glory seeds. Peppers and eggplants can be transplanted when the bearded irises are blooming. Okay, so. I don't doubt that these are all good, reliable ways to decide when to plant things, but look at all the different things you have to have nearby as indicators. You have to have forsythia. You have to have daffodils. You gotta have dandelions. <laughs> uh, you know, you gotta have maple trees. All right, lots of those, I guess, but um, quince, apple trees, uh, lilacs, lily of the valley, right? Uh, irises, <laughs> right? So on and so forth, right? Uh, there's another one. Peony blossom, uh, it's safe to plant heat-loving melons. Oh, you got to have peonies. So all of these, it, I mean, I'm sure these all work, but who's got all of these things nearby? And the reason this system works really well is because it's giving you a kind of temperature measure right on your property, or right, even if, if the garden's not on your property, you know, if, you're, if you've got a you know, community plot or um, what do they call them in England? Allotment, um, or UK, not England. Um, you know, that sort of thing. If you're watching these plants, you want plants that are right next to where your garden is, because that tells you how much sun, energy, 
has affected the soil right there. Right? The dandelion is not going to do anything until there's been enough sun to heat the soil, to get the soil the right temperature, for the plant, because you know, in the winter the plant just dies back and it stays alive in the soil. So the soil has to be warm enough for the plant to start doing stuff. Right? Then it starts sending out leaves. Once it sends out the leaves, the leaves start gathering energy from the sun through photosynthesis. The leaves have to have enough growth to send up a flower. Right? It will, the flower will not happen until the leaves have had enough sun. Right? The flower will not bloom until it's, it's reached its maturity stage. So that one plant, for me, because it's got these diff very obvious, distinct stages of growth, is a really good indicator of how much heat energy has been absorbed into your soil and how much sunny days you've had where you are. And the great thing about dandelions is everyone's got them, right? Even if, let's say, you've got one of these lawns where you're just on top of everything, uh, you either blast it with some, <laughs> something that kills them all the time or get some company to come in and deal with them for you, or you're out there picking them under the ground. I mean, I find if you've got kids, uh, picking dandelions is a, a great punishment <laughs> for bad behavior. Because <laughs> the kids hate it. <laughs> Who doesn't hate picking dandelions? You send them out there with a bucket and a little tool, and you say, you can come inside when the bucket's full of dandelions. And, and they show, you show them how the dandelions have to be pulled out by the roots, right? Um, but no matter how many dandelions I pull out of my lawn, I still have other dandelions, right? And even if I had a perfect lawn, or if you have a perfect lawn, the lawn next door, maybe the, the, you know, the cracks in the road next to your house, right? They're going to be around. The dandelions are always around. They're everywhere. You can't get away from them unless you live in some country where there's no dandelions, I suppose. Um, and, and perhaps this uh, guy doesn't work everywhere in the world, all right? I'm, I'm speaking, I live in Nova Scotia, Canada. It's uh, zone 6A according to our Canadian zones, if the Canadian zones aren't the same thing as the American zones, aren't the same thing as the UK zones, probably aren't the same thing as the European zones. But roughly speaking, I live in Canada. It's April. There's snow. It's not a particularly warm place, even though my province is one of the sort of warmer ones, I suppose, uh, although we don't have the hottest summers, but that's a whole other diatribe I don't want to get into. Um, let's back up a little bit here, okay? Most guides based on calendar dates. They're based on calendar dates relative to the last frost. If you have seed packages, okay, and it'll say plant as soon as soil, you have directions on the back of the package. It'll say plant as soon as the soil can be worked, or it'll say plant two weeks before the last frost date. Plant after the last frost date. Plant six weeks before the last frost date. It'll have instructions like that. And most of the relatively sophisticated online planting apps, you, you have to plump, you, you know, you have to look up the last frost date for where you live, you punch that in, and then it rolls out all these planting times for your vegetables. Well, for me, when I looked, I looked, I looked, I just did a Google search, last frost date, Halifax. That's the largest major city near me. It's about a 20 minute drive from my house. Um, Last frost date, Halifax, 2023. Uh, the first two hits on Google gave me two different dates. One of them said it's somewhere between April 21st and April 30th. The other one said May 8th. Now, I have lived here, and it usually says something like that, okay? Every year it says something like that. I've lived at this location since 2011. Um, that has never been the last frost date here, ever. Okay. We usually get a frost at the end of May. Sometimes we get a frost at the beginning of June. Sometimes we get a frost in the middle of June, right? Sometimes we, there's, we might even get a frost right up until July sometimes, but usually June, the first week of June is usually when it's over, but not always, you know? Um, so if I use these online apps and based everything on what some calendar or some app somewhere or some algorithm, I'm a big fan of algorithms, don't get me wrong, but some algorithm, some, someone's figured out some equation, um, I would be doing everything. There's a lot of things I would be doing. I'd be putting tomatoes out in the end of April. I'm putting tomatoes, because that, apparently that's the last, fro last frost date. I tell you right now, anyone that puts their tomatoes out at the end of April in Nova Scotia, they have to be really lucky. 
you get it, you have just the right spot, you know, like next to a huge rock, south facing, everything, right? The risk of putting something like that out on that date is just ridiculous, right? So I find none of these things work. They've never worked for me. Because uh, my, la I don't know what it is about where I live here, and I lived in different parts of the province here. Um, so I used to live in a place called a valley, which is an agricultural zone. I could plant things out two or three weeks earlier than I can here, right? But that's the value of using an approach like this, because you're planting things based on indicators you're getting from things that are growing in the ground right where you are. And something you're probably going to have, the dandelion. And all of these guides work on calendar dates and averages for large areas. Right, so the, whatever this thing is saying, the last frost date for Halifax is May 8th. I'm sure there's somewhere in Halifax that might be true, but it's not true right here. <laughs> not true at all. <laughs> Never been. <laughs> you know, I mean, I suppose any years, you know, anything could happen. Maybe this is the year where May 8th is the last frost date where I am. Uh, I'm not going to bet the transplants I've spent, you know, two months carefully growing indoors on that. I'm not going to plant, uh, you know, a, a $4 pack of cucumber seeds on that date, only to just have them get it really cold and damp and die the, in a couple nights, right? All those sorts of things, right? For me, it just makes much more sense to work backwards from all the different plants that you want to plant in your garden, what their minimum germination temperature is and then have an indicator that tells you when it's likely to be, you know, when the soil, the minimum germination te temperature is, you know, how warm the soil needs to be for, uh, for that seed to start activating, <laughs> right? To start germinating, okay? Uh, so for me, it makes much more sense to have an indicator of when your soil is at that stage, right? Because that's, I mean, before the soil is at that stage, at the minimum germination temperature, whatever you're trying to grow, nothing's going to happen. Or even worse, the seeds could die, right? Some seeds have a minimum germination temperature, let's say uh, spinach, minimum germination temperature of two degrees, I'm gonna do this all in Celsius, okay? Uh, the table I've got on my article, it's got both Fahrenheit and Celsius, depending on, you know, what, what century you're working in or whatever, what, what country you're working in or what, whatever your system is, okay? Um, so spinach has a minimum germination temperature of two, okay? But the great thing about a spinach seed is that if it goes to zero or below freezing, it won't kill the seed. I don't know how cold it has to get to kill the seed, um, but, it, you know, um, if the dandelion greens are up, I've found the seed won't die. Now, everything has a minimum germination temperature, but it also has an optimum germination temperature, right? So just because something has a minimum germination temperature of two doesn't mean that's ideal. It just means things can start to happen, okay? Uh, so the spinach is a good example. The minimum germination temperature is 2 degrees Celsius. The optimum germination temperature is 21 degrees Celsius. So at 21C, and, and most plants, their optimum germination temperature is somewhere near 20 Celsius. Um, some plants are higher than that, some plants are slightly lower. Most of them are just above 20C, okay? But most of they all have a minimum temperature below that. Um, so if you're looking at the dandelion as an indicator, for me, right, when the dandelion greens start to appear, that's when you can assume the soil is, I mean, that wouldn't be happening if the soil wasn't mostly thawed or thawed most of the time, let's put it that way. The dandelion just would be dormant if the soil was frozen, right? Because um, it can't, you know, if the soil is frozen, it can't take up water, it can't take up nutrients, it, the roots can't do their thing, right? Just nothing can work properly. So for there to be dandelion greens, you've got this dandelion that's in the ground and it goes down like a foot. Right? So it's literally plugged in. And it's like a temperature indicator, a relatively sophisticated temperature indicator plugged right into your soil, all over the place in your property. And what could you buy that could even come close to, to doing that good of a job? It's like measuring all day long, doesn't fail. <laughs> Batteries don't die, right? You don't have to keep paying for them. They just keep, keep, show, keep showing up, right? Um, so when you see those greens appear, it means that the soil's been warm enough for that to happen. And for me, it means that it's probably uh, a good time, and it should be relatively reliable, to plant all those tough things I mentioned earlier, right? The uh, lettuce, onion, things like onion, 
uh, parsnip and spinach. Okay, there's other things too, right? But those are your basic garden things. Um, any plant, I mean, there's lots of different resources online. Any plant, you can just Google it, whatever you want to grow, minimum germination temperature. So if it's all of those things, that I, the things I just mentioned, have a minimum germination temperature of two Celsius. And I'm sure there's variation within the plant. I'm sure some varieties of lettuce have a higher minimum. Some varieties of lettuce have a lower minimum, that sort of thing. Okay, so there's always variation, right? There's so many different, what is it, like a couple hundred different kinds of lettuce, right? There's different varieties of everything. Now, once the dandelions turn yellow, think of how much time has had to go by and how much heat has been absorbed by the soil, right? And how much uh, photosynthesis has happened in the plant. Right, you got all the leaves are fully developed, right? It's, it's sent up a big flowering shoot. Right? There's a lot going on there, right? So for me, that's when you can plant what they're called semi-hardy plants. So they're, they're tough, but they're not super tough. There's a, a lot of things we grow in our garden are like that. I listed them earlier. But most of these things, they have a minimum germination temperature of four. And for anyone that's you know, had year after year after year problems growing carrots, um, Planting your carrots when you see the yellow dandelion flowers is pretty reliable. I mean, and the great thing about keeping track of indicators like this is that, at least where I am, at that stage of spring, there's still a lot of rain, right? So it's relatively low maintenance to plant a lot of things when the yellow dandelion shows up, because it's still spring in a lot of ways. There's still rain, so there's not as much watering. And a lot of, some of these plants, they have like a, you know, the distance between their minimum and their maximum is relatively narrow. You can cook them. So there's been years I've tried to plant carrots under my plastic domes, and it's gotten too hot and killed them all, right? Um, so it can just be more reliable just to plant them out. I mean, carrots, you can eat them in August, but carrots taste so much better in October and November after you've had a few frosts. They just, they, they chemically, the chemical composition of the carrot changes, and they just taste so much sweeter and so much better after a few frosts. So you don't need to be in a rush to tr plant carrots or parsnips for that matter, right? Uh, they're gonna take a long time and they're gonna start to be really good in the fall when you've got some frost. Um, so all of those things have a slightly higher minimum. You wouldn't see the difference between two and four would mean a lot, but it does because the things with that minimum germination temperature of two, the other things that don't seem to be mind having a night where it goes below freezing, right? Um, if I have uh, kale, Swiss chard growing in the garden, and, and these are both things with a minimum germination temperature of four Celsius, not two Celsius, um, and they're just exposed to the elements. And I come out in the morning and the goldfish pond's got a, you know, an inch of ice on it, and the garden hose is frozen solid, <laughs> okay? So we had a hard freeze. Um, that will destroy some of the foliage on some of those plants, right? Even onions, I've had onions, the, the, you know, the shoots get destroyed by frost. Um, but in most cases I've found the onion comes back fairly quickly. It's not completely killed by it. Whereas things like beets, for instance, which again are supposed to be semi-hardy, um, but a good frost can really set a beet back because you just lose all that foliage, right? The plant's got to put out new leaves, that sort of sets it back. Um, so waiting a little longer, right? Not at the dandelion green, but at the dandelion yellow. Is, is more reliable. And some of those things on the list that can be planted when the dandelion's turning yellow, those seeds aren't as tough in terms of the temperatures dropping below zero at night, below freezing at night. Um, you know, some, some plants can be frozen and thawed at any stage of their growth and they just can they just truck on, doesn't bother them at all. Some plants are kind of finicky about that sort of thing. And uh, you know, once, once they germinate, if they freeze, they're dead, right? So some things, I, I can't create an exhaustive list. It's just safer to, for those things to plant them when you see the dandelion turn yellow. And, you know, nothing's guaranteed in life, but the risk is lower, okay? And then when the dandelion turns white, I have found that it's a pretty good indicator that there's very, very low risk of frost. I mean, people will use an indicator like the last... First, the first new moon in June, okay? Um, but that doesn't tell you how much heat has been absorbed by the soil where you are. It just tells you the phase of the moon. I mean, it's, it's a good indicator because it's in bloody June, right? <laughs> but if you've got, you know, if you've got a whole bunch of dandelions that 
uh, have gone white. It means that you know, you've, you've had a lot of sunny days, you've had a lot of heat, you've had a lot of warmth. That plant has developed a lot, right? So you kind of think this is a plant that survived, I don't know how many millions of years, right? <laughs> but if it, was go, if it was going through its different stages consistently at the wrong time, I don't think it would have done so well um, in terms of um, you know, passing on its genes and surviving the millennia, right? So I think it's a pretty safe and robust indicator of seasonal change. Now another great thing about organizing your planting dates this way is that it's really easy to organize your seeds, right? So all you have to do is have a bundle of things that go in when the dandelion greens are up, right? And a bundle of things that go up when the dandelion yellows are up. And a bundle of things that go in when the dandelion whites are up, right? So right here I've got, um, what do we got here? A little bundle of seeds or just, right, or this time of year, right? This is, this is, I don't know if it is, but I think it is because I've seen, I've seen some dandelion greens growing in my garden. Not a lot, okay, but I've seen them. So I go out in the garden, I want to plant stuff. All I got to do is stick this in my pocket and bring it with me. I got parsnips, I've got uh, leeks, spinach, and uh, lettuce, okay? So I don't have to think about it. Stick this in my pocket. You now, if I was really smart, I'd put a big green mark on these so I know these are the dandelion green things, right? And then in another, uh, another couple weeks, I can have this pack here where I've got a whole bunch of different, uh, you know, coal crop type greens like kale and stuff like that, some different Chinese greens, uh, Swiss chard, um, pak choy, which I tried last year and really liked, uh, carrots, peas, right? Brussels sprouts, you're gonna try this year, beets, right? Peas, uh, super sugar snap peas, right? I got it all right here, right? It's so, once I start seeing yellow dandelions, I come home from work, have a quick supper, um, crack open a beer, go out in the garden. I just bring, bring these with me. I a little, got a little piece of paper with my garden map on it. It tells me where everything should go. And I don't have to think about it so much, right? These are the things that go on the ground at that time of year. Right? Then I got this pack of here when it's dandelion yellow. And I've also got my transplants on in the house. Sorry, dandelion white, right? When I start seeing the dandelion whites. I got transplants in the house. And I'll put those out when dandelion whites appear. Also, it's time to plant things like uh, butternut squash and uh, right here, butternut squash, summer squash, magda squash, pumpkin, cucumber, winter squash. I got uh, the winter sweet this year, and uh, I think a sweet mama. I think that's what I went with this year. Cilantro, cilantro, right? Um, so that's when all that stuff can go in, right? So I don't have to think about it so much. And also your um, different kinds of beans, right? So I got all the different different kinds of beans I'm going to plant this year, right? So that's a great way to organize your seeds. It's extremely low tech. It takes minutes. I mean, I know I've done videos on organizing seeds around what to plant in April, what to plant in May, what to plant in June, that sort of thing. And that's kind of what this is, but it's not as crude, right? Instead of tying it to a month, you're tying it to something that measures the amount of sun energy that's been received by the soil where you're actually planting. So it's, it's a little more sophisticated, despite the fact that it's dead easy because you're just watching dandelions grow, right? Uh, it's also good to have a few in your garden, right? Uh, a couple of years ago, I planted a perennial called uh, Italian Punto dandelion for the greens. And so I've got those growing in the garden every year. And, you know, when they start to grow, uh, it's one of my first greens. I tend to use them as a cooked green. They don't taste, to me, so good as a salad green. Um, but they're great as a cooked green. I like adding them to spaghetti sauce. Um, but once I see them starting to grow in my garden, and I have them in a part of the garden which doesn't get the best sun, so I know when they're growing, everything's nice and warm. So it's a really good trick to get an edible dandelion, plant it in your garden, right? Plant it somewhere you want it. Um, don't let it go to flower, right? And then you've got a great indicator. But your chances are you're going to have dandelions all over the place near your garden anyway. It's a good indicator, okay? Now, in terms of tricking things, breaking the rules. And again, these are rules of thumb. You adjust them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a bit. 
um, getting you know more nuanced with these things. But in terms of cheating, all you have to do if you're going to use one of those big like domes like I use in my garden, some sort of microclimate, a cold frame, or um, you know an unheated greenhouse, or like like I have these sort of mini greenhouses, right? Um, just small sort of hoops that you stick over a garden bed. As a general rule, when it's you know before you know like in March, I'll plant spinach and lettuce under a dome, right? The dandelions aren't even growing yet, but it's like a month before that's probably going to happen, right? When you start seeing yellow dandelions, or when, you, when the dandelion greens appear, right? Under a dome, you can plant the dandelion yellow plants, generally speaking, right? When the dandelions turn yellow under a dome, there's risks, but you can plant um, the dandelion white plants. I mean, there's years, I usually do this with tomatoes. I will direct seed tomatoes in the ground at dandelion yellow under a hoop house. Sometimes you have a cold night and it gets really cold and they all die. <laughs> it does happen, right? Uh, but man, the years when it works, those dandelions are so well adapted, right? Because they've been growing outside the whole time, right? Uh, it can really work well. And I mean, the only reason I've had them die is because I've had a particularly cold night and I might have had them propped up a bit or I didn't have a perfect, usually with my domes, they're not perfect domes, or I didn't put a tarp over the dome. I mean, if you've got a dome over a thing like dandelion that you're direct seeding when there's still a risk of frost, you're taking risks, right? But there's a huge payoff for like two bucks worth of seeds, right? Um, so all you have to do is if you are concerned that you're going to have a really cold night, just put a big tarp over the whole thing overnight and lift it off the next morning before you go to work, right? Um, also, when you're using domes like that, the trick your plants, remember your seed has a minimum an optimum temperature. And as a temperature, it can be that's so hot it kills the seed or kills the seedling. Right, so on any day where it's gonna be really sunny, even if it's a cold day, it's gonna be really sunny, you gotta vent your dome, right? That could just mean just lifting up one side of it and putting a rock underneath it or something like that just so the air can get out, right? Because it can get too hot in there, it'll just kill everything. Last year, I killed uh, almost an entire bed of beets. I had beets that were six inches high when everybody else's beets were tiny. I was doing so well. They got too hot, right? Just I had a really hot day. I was at work. I forgot to, you know, either take the dome off or just, oh, just lift it up a little bit so the air can get out. And they were just killed. They didn't come back either. They were just nuked. <laughs> a whole plant. <laughs> Not only was the foliage killed, but the soil got so hot, I killed the plant, right? So you got to be careful with that sort of thing. Also, in terms of nuance, I mentioned earlier about maybe you don't plant all the dandelion green or dandelion yellow plants when you see your first dandelion green or yellow. Maybe you wait right, until you see a few, or you see a few in a different areas, right? Furthermore, um, if you're concerned about a particular plant, uh, maybe it had, didn't work the year before, Maybe you don't have, like, so one of the dandelion green plants, let's say it didn't do so well, a particular variety. Maybe instead of planting it the minute you see the dandelion begin to grow, plant it when the greens have some height. So you still don't have the dandelion flower yet, dandelion yellow as I call it, right? But it's been a couple weeks, right? Right, so you can use those little indicators. Same with um, the flower. You know, there are some plants that are dandelion yellow that you can plant when the buds appear and they haven't even opened up yet, right? And there's some plants you might want to wait until a lot, you see a lot of yellow dandelion flowers around. And the same thing with dandelion white, right? There's some things, and I don't know what the, all these things are, right? <laughs> I usually just, you know, wait till I see a lot, right? But there's some, I'm just saying this, this kind of a nuanced approach, right? That there's some things you can plant when you see if you've got some peppers in your house that you've been growing since March and they're very precious to you and you, you, you don't have 100% confidence that you're past all risk of frost, right? You see some dandelions turn white. Well, wait till you see a lot of dandelions turn white to be a little bit more safe. Or let's say you see the dandelions turn white, but when you blow on the flower, the little seeds don't fly off, right? Maybe you want to wait till you can blow on some of the flowers and the seeds fly off because you know it's that much longer, right? 
Or maybe you put some out as soon as you see the dandelion turn white and you keep a few indoors for insurance. And you put the rest of them out once you see that the flowers, the, the little white things are actually starting to fall off, off the flower. The seeds are starting to fly off of the flower, right? So there's all these little things you can do to safeguard the risk of putting something out too early. It's, it's good to be conservative as a gardener and hold back a few things. You don't plant everything, even if you're planting seeds that are supposed to be tough and supposed to be hardy. I mean, I planted some of my spinach uh, in March under plastic domes. I didn't plant all of it, right? I'll be planting the rest of it as soon as I really can confirm that I've got dandelion greens really growing around the house. I don't think I do yet because once the dandelion greens start growing around my property, I start seeing rabbits and porcupines on my property. Now, I mean, this year, for whatever reason, the rabbit population just seemed to crash. Uh, so not a lot of rabbits around, but they are around, right? They're never completely gone. Rabbits have like a 10 year cycle where the population just <laughs> almost goes down to nothing and then they come back and they're plentiful again. They've been doing that forever. Um, but porcupines don't have that. So they don't, they don't have any, they have a couple predators, but <laughs> basically porcupines are around all the time. Um, so at some point in spring, I see porcupine at, in the evening, right? At dusk, right? We like to take a nice walk after supper sometimes. At dusk, you see porcupines, you know, uh, in the undeveloped areas in the ditches. Uh, there's a forest everywhere where I live. They're eating greens. They're probably eating dandelion greens, right? Um, and I'll see them on my front line. My front lawn has way more dandelions than the backyard. <laughs> so I tend to see dandy uh, the uh, porcupines on my front lawn. Uh, at dusk, but also uh, if I'm up late or if I get up at you know 2 a.m. to use the bathroom, <laughs> I always look out on the lawn because there's like you know just enough light moonlight I can see stuff, right? As soon as I see porcupines, <laughs> I can have a whole nother chart on like different animals, right? And the smelts, uh, you know, the peepers and the porcupines are eating uh, eating my lawn, or they're not eating grass on the lawn, they're eating like other vegetative things and I think dandelion greens is probably one of their favorite things. I've noticed when the dandelion greens are really starting to develop I start seeing porcupines <laughs> on my front lawn. So that's my little indicator, right? So there's all these little things you can do. I mean a lot of you don't live somewhere where there's porcupines foraging on your front lawn, okay? But I'm just saying I'm letting the porcupine do the work for me. When the porcupines show up I know I've got a lot of dandelion greens so I don't have to be that sophisticated about it. I mean, today the snow is starting to melt. This morning when I came out to shoot this video, my lawn was completely white. And now it seems to be mostly green. <laughs> so uh, I'll go have a look around, but I don't think there's a lot of uh, dandelions developing yet. But because I know that I can plant parsnips in the fall, because parsnip seeds are invincible, I'm going to plant some parsnip seeds this weekend. That's fine, right? And maybe some lettuce. So I've done the same thing with lettuce. I've broadcast lettuce seeds in the fall. You know, I've had years where my lettuce plants have got a, have a variety of lettuce that's uh, open pollinated, like an heirloom. And uh, in the fall, I let it to go to seed. And I just threw them all over what I call a hippie garden. I just threw them all over the place on a garden, right? And then in March, I put a dome over the garden. And you know, within about a month, I had all kinds of um, all kinds of lettuce growing in that garden. Well, those lettuce seeds survived the entire winter being frozen and thawed and frozen and thawed and encased in ice and snowed on and rained on and everything you can imagine, right? All the different extremes, down to minus 20 Celsius, the you know, 20 below, below freezing, all those extremes. So I know, I mean, I can't speak to every type of lettuce seed, but a lot of lettuce seeds are unbelievably tough, right? So I'll probably plant some lettuce uh, this weekend, right? And I might be wait a little bit longer to plant the onions and, uh, and the spinach, right? And also, it, it, it bears, bears mentioning, and it's something worthwhile to bear in mind to, to manage your expectations, that just because the soil is at a plant's minimum germination temperature, that doesn't mean... So, what am I trying to say? If you're a gardener that's always planting things, you know, after all, I mean, a lot of gardeners don't even do anything till like the end of May, which is fine, but I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can plant before the end of May, believe me. Um, things germinate slower uh, this time of year. 
If you're planting anything that can handle the cold temperatures and has a very low minimum germination temperature, that doesn't mean it's going to germinate in one week. You know, if you put a lettuce seed in a seed tray in a window in your house, that thing will germinate in a week, right? You'll have, <laughs> you'll have lettuce growing in a week, right? Or most other seeds too. There's very few things that take, like peppers the only thing that comes to mind that take like three weeks to germinate sometimes. Sometimes they'll germinate in a week, sometimes they won't. Um, you know, once your soil is like 16, 20 degrees, right, a lot of things germinate, no problem, but when it's at that temperature or warmer, right, but at 2 degrees Celsius, 4 degrees Celsius, the seed will germinate, but it's going to take its time, it's not going to do it as quickly as you'd think. And so you might ask, well, why would you even bother then if it's going to take so long? Well, it's just, if you have, especially if you have a large garden, but if you just want to get out and do things, it will not hurt the plant to have a slow germination, right? It will not hurt the plant to, to be put out early and just have a kind of lazy germination stage of its life. Every single thing in nature works that way, right? So plants can get by doing that just fine. Also, you're a gardener. You want to get out there. You want to get at it. You want to start doing things. And if you're like me and you have a large garden, right, you don't want to have to do everything in one weekend, right? Especially when you're getting to be my age, you want to sort of do a little bit every day. So anything I can do early in the season, I want to, also this time of year, there's no, notice I'm not being swarmed right now, right? There's no flies yet. They'll be around eventually, right? Sometime in late April or May, start getting black flies. But I want to do as much as I can in the garden when it's magic like this, where it's, it's warm enough to do stuff, but there's no insects uh, trying to, uh, you know, feast on my flesh, right? <laughs> so another reason to put some things in early like this is you can just get stuff done, you can get ahead of the game, and you're not completely overwhelmed by all these things you got to do at the end of May or the beginning of June or whenever it is, um, you know, everybody where you live says you should put a garden in. Uh, and yeah, don't listen to those people. <laughs> There's a lot of things you can start putting in earlier. There's no reason not to. Um, the table I've got in that article, which I've been showing on the screen, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, that's a good guide relative to the stages of the growth of the dandelion uh, for when to plant things. And, you know, I welcome anyone to give me their insights um, in the comments section. I, I'm not interested in, I do forsythia, and I do tulip, and I do lilacs, and I'm not interested in that at all. <laughs> Okay, if you do that, great, if that works for you. I mean, I started doing it this way because I find that impossible to keep track of, and I don't have all those things growing on my property. Um, so I like using just the dandelion. Um, but if you've used, I mean, aside from everybody knows, plant your potatoes when you see the yellow dandelions. Um, but if you've been using something like that, or you've got some insights about that sort of thing, uh, if there's things that I don't have on my list of vegetables here that you want me to add, please uh, let me know and I'll, I'll expand the table and make it larger. Or anything else you think might, I might want to add to that table, I'm happy to, to enhance and develop it and that sort of thing. So anyway, I think that's enough about that topic. I think I've, I've walked through most of it. I think I've covered everything I, I set out to, uh, to cover today. I'm sorry the light's been so weird out here. It's just this is the only place I could find that wasn't too windy and I wanted to do this outside. I didn't want to be inside at my computer. I wanted some nature and some birds and some wind and just, you know, I just wanted to, be outside. So we hope, hope you found it interesting. If you did, please like, share, subscribe. And until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching. Hey, if you want to help support everything I'm doing here, go to Vessies.com to buy whatever you need for your garden this year. Use my coupon code GAVS23 to get free shipping as long as there's a pack of seeds in the order and there's no oversized items in the order. Check out the description box of this video for details. You can buy everything you need from Vessies. They have seeds, fruit bushes and trees, soil amendments, pest solutions, tools, clothing, and lots of other stuff too. So yeah, if you want to help support everything I'm doing here and they sell something you need, buy it from them using my coupon code. And happy gardening.